For such as these, Duke Theseus did his best. He comforted and honored every guest, and ordered revelry to last the night. For all the foreign princes, as was right, none were discouraged or in discontent. It was a jousting, just a tournament. Why should they be discouraged, after all? It's only an accident to have a fall. There is no shame in being borne by force, unyielded to the stake by twenty horse. Alone, with none to help, it must be so, harried away by arm and foot and toe. And on a horse, maddened by sticks and noise, by men on foot, by yeomen and their boys, there's nothing despicable in all this. No one could ever call it cowardice, and therefore Theseus made proclamation to stop all rancor, grudge, and emulation, that each side was as valorous as the other, and both as like as brother is to brother. He gave them gifts to each in his degree. And for, and for three days they held festivity. Then he conveyed the kings in solemn state out of the city far beyond the gate, and home went everyone by various ways, with no more than good-bye and happy days. The battle done with, I may now go on to speak of poor Arcite and Palamon. Up swells Arcita's breast, the grievous sore about his heart increases more and more, the clotting blood for all the doctor's skill corrupts and festers in his body still, that neither cupping, bleeding in a vein, or herbal drink can make him well again. The expulsive forces, known as animal, had lost their power to cleanse the natural, of poison and that could not be expelled. His lungs began to choke, the vessels swelled, clotted was every muscle in his chest by poison and corruption in his breast. Nor could he profit in his will to live by upward vomit or by laxative. All, all was shattered and beyond repair. Nature no longer had dominion there, and certainly where nature will not work, physic farewell, go bear the man to Kirk. This is the sum of all. Our seat must die. And so he sent for Emily to be by, and Palamon, the cousin of his heart, and thus he spoke, preparing to depart. Nothing of all the sorrows in my breast can declare itself to be exp or be expressed to you, O oh lady, that I love the most, but I bequeath the service of my ghost to you above all creatures in the world. Now that my life is done and banner furled, alas the woe, alas the pain so strong, that I have suffered for you in so long. Alas, O oh death, alas, my Emily, alas, the parting of our company, alas, my heart's own queen, alas, my wife, O oh lady of my heart, that ends my life. What is this world? What does man ask to have? Now with his love, now in his cold, cold grave, lying alone with none for company. Farewell, my sweetest foe, my Emily, O oh, softly take me in your arms, I pray, for love of God, and hearken what I say. I have here, with my cousin Palamon, had strife and rancor many days now gone. For love of you, and for my jealousy, and may Jove's wisdom touch the soul in me, to speak of love, and what is and what its service means, through all the circumfer through, through all the circumstances, and the scenes of life, namely, good faith and knightly deed, wisdom, humility, and noble breed, honor and truth and openness of heart. For, as I hope my soul may have its part with Jove in all the world, I know of none so worthy to be loved as Palamon, who serves, who serves you and will serve you all his life. And should you ever choose to be a wife, Forget not Palamon, that great-hearted man, speech failed him, the cold of death began, its upward creeping from his feet to numb the breast, and he was slowly overcome, and further still, as from his arms there went, the vital power, all was lost and spent, 
Only the intellect and nothing more that dwelt within his heart so sick and sore began to falter when the heart felt death, dusked his two eyes at last and failed his breath, and yet he gazed at her while he could see, and his last word was, Mercy, Emily. His spirit changed its house and went away. Where I came never, where I cannot stay. And so am silent, I am no divine. Souls are not mentioned in this tale of mine. I offer no opinion, I can tell you nothing. Though some have written, where they dwell, Our seat is cold, Mars guides him on his way. Something of Emily, I have to say. Palamon howls, and Emily is shrieking, and Theseus leads away his sister seeking to bear her from the corpse. She faints away. Why tarry on her tears or spend the day, telling you how she wept both Eve and Morrow? For in these cases women feel such sorrow when it befalls their husbands to be taken, the greater part seem utterly forsaken and fall into a sickness so extreme that many of them perish, it would seem. Infinite were the sorrows and the tears of older folk and those of tender years throughout the town, all this, all for the Stephen's death, wept man and boy, and sure a wilder breath of lamentation never had been heard since Hector, freshly slaughtered, was interred in Troy. Alas, to see the morning there, the scabbed faces, the scabbled faces, the disheveled hair, must you have died, a woman wailed, for see, had you not gold enough for Emily? No one could lighten Theseus of his care, except his father, old Aegeus there, who knew the transmutations of the world, and he had seen its changes as it whirled, bliss upon sorrow, sorrow upon bliss, and gave his son instruction upon this. Just as there never died a man, said he, but had in some, but had in life some station or degree. Just so there never lived a man, he said, in all the world, but in the end was dead. This world is but a thoroughfare of woe, and we are pilgrims passing to and fro. Death is the end of every worldly sore. On top of this, he said a great deal more to this effect with wisest exhortation, heartening the people in their tribulation. In time, the thoughts of, the of Theseus were astir to find a site and build a sepulchre for good our sight, and how it best might be ordained to fit his honor and decree. And, degree. and in the end, the place decided on was where our seat first met with Palamon, in battle for their love, and there between the branches, in that very grove of green, where he had sung his amorous desire, in sad complaint and felt love hot so and felt love hot as fire, he planned a fire to make in funeral observances, and so accomplish all. So he commanded them to hack and fell the ancient oak trees and lay them well in rows and bundles faggoted to burn. Forth ride his officers, and soon return on swiftest foot with his commandments done. And after this, Theseus appointed one to fetch a buyer, and had it fitly clad in cloth of gold, the finest that he had. And in the self-same cloth he clad our sight, and on his hands white gauntlets, as was meet, he placed, and on his head, a laurel crown, and in his hand, the sword of his renown, and laid him bare, his face upon the bier. He laid him bare, his face upon the bier, and wept upon him, pity was to hear. And that his body might be seen by all, when it was day, he bore him to the hall, that roared with mourning sounds in unison. Then came that woeful Thebian, Palamon, with fluttering beard and ash-besprinkled hair, in sable garments stained with many a tear. 
Yet passing all in weeping, Emily was the most sorrowful of the company. And that the service to be held might be the nobler, more befitting his degree, Duke Theseus commanded them to bring three steeds, all trapped in steel and glittering, and mantled with the arms of Prince Arcite. Upon these huge white steeds that paced the street, first there rode one who bore Arcita's shield, a second bore the spear he used to wield, his Turkish bow and quiver of burnished gold was given to the third of them to hold. Slowly they paced, their countenances drear, toward the destined grove, as you shall hear. Upon the shoulders of the noblest men among the Greeks there came the coffin then. Their eyes were red with tears, their slackened feet paced through the city by the master street. The way was spread with black, and far on high black draperies hung downward from the sky. The old Aegeus to the right was placed, with Theseus on his left, and so they paced, bearing gold vessels of a rare design, brimming with honey and milk, with blood and wine. And then came Palamon with his company, and after that the woeful Emily, with fire in her hand, the custom then used in the obsequies in the obsequies of famous men. The solemn work of building up the pyre was done in splendor, and they laid a fire that reached to heaven in a cone of green. The arms were twenty fathoms broad, I mean, the boughs and branches heaped upon the ground. The straw in piles had first been loaded round. But how they made the funeral fires flame, or what the trees by number or by name, oak, fir tree, birch, aspen, and poplar too, ilex and alder, willow, elm, and yew, box, chestnut, plain, ash, laurel, thorn, and lime, beech, hazel, whipple tree, I lack the time to tell you, or who felled them, nor can tell how their poor gods ran up and down the dell. All disinherited of habitation, robbed of their quest, and in desolation, the nymph and dryad of the forest lawn, the, hamad, the hamadryad, and the subtle fawn, these I pass over, birds and beasts as well, that fled in terror when the forest fell. Nor shall I say how in, in the sudden light of the unwanted sun the dell took fright, nor how the fire first was couched in straw, then in dry sticks thrice severed with a saw.